the shop at the website www.communist-party.org.uk forward backslash. Finally, just on these housekeeping items, there will be a collection at the end of the meeting to help defray the costs of organising this meeting tonight. All donations are gratefully received. Um, as unlike George Osborne, this evening standard, which is holding a meeting as we speak at the main hall in Conway Hall tonight, how, how I run, I'm sure they're not going to be interested in the interest of the working class and working people in this country. Um, we have no big business backers and we therefore need to try and defray our costs. So I'd be grateful if you've got anything that you could help us with, any, any donation gratefully received. Comrades and friends, Brexit is the most important political issue we have seen for a generation in this country. And whilst it offers potentially great progressive value for the British working class, it is also potentially fraught with danger. The Communist Party has always opposed the common market, as it was called in the 1970s when we campaigned, and subsequently the EU and the various guises that it's gone through. And we've always been very clear that membership of the EU is not in the best interests of the British working class. Currently on our television screens and in the papers, we see daily the internecine warfare and public meltdown of the Tory party. They are divided and squabbling amongst themselves and are seemingly incoherent on this issue. However, these warring factions within the Tory party are all united in the goal of seeking to bind workers and a future Labour government with EU market and competition rules after Britain leaves the EU. They want to pursue bargain basement trade deals that reward monopoly capital and profiteers at the expense of workers. The Labour Party position is somewhat confused <coughs> in my opinion. On the one hand, Jeremy Corbyn has stated they will respect the referendum result and on the other, we have Keir Starmer standing, stating that they want to remain in the single market and the customs union for a lengthy period. There is a battle between Labour's regressive right wing and those who understand that the pursuit of socialist and public ownership policies are not possible whilst we remain in the EU. What is proposed by a section of EU supporters in the Parliamentary Labour Party is essentially remain in the EU by any other name. They are true believers in the capitalist free market fundamentalism of the EU and most share the same dedication to nuclear weapons and NATO. These are the same Labour MPs who oppose the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn and the shadow chancellor of John McDonald because they oppose public ownership, economic planning and the radical redistribution of wealth and socialism. They also understand that membership of the European Economic Area with its subjection to the EU Court of Justice or its EFTA puppet would obstruct the kind of policies that won Labour millions of extra votes in June's general election, like, for example, the public ownership of railways, water and energy, a national investment bank, and people's quantitative easing to enhance our public services. The EU, in our opinion, is fundamentally opposed to working class <coughs> interests and exists to promote the interests of monopoly capital and big business. Its pursuit of totally unnecessary austerity policies threaten national democratic processes. You only have to look at what happened in Greece to see that is a reality. <coughs> it also wants to prevent member states from implementing independent economic policies. EU rules erode <coughs> collective bargaining, promote the privatisation of public services and prevent the renationalisation of the energy companies of British Rail. They also prevent support for strategic industries. The main concern of the EU has always been to ensure that businesses can employ desperate workers from one part of Europe on terms that undermine pay and conditions and trade unions as well in another state. Free movement has never been about and extended to people outside fortress Europe, most of whom are non-white and have been kept out by ever-rising barriers. The Communist Party wants to promote debate and discussion about <coughs> how we achieve a people's Brexit based on socialist policies that respect the rights 
of other European countries. And in Europe, of democratic states that value public services, guarantees the rights of workers, and put the interests of working people above those of big business. Our speakers tonight will put forward left and labour movement perspectives for a Brexit for the people. And I will ask each speaker to address the meeting for 10 minutes each. And at the end of that round of speaking, I will see contributions and questions from the audience. Once that has been done, I will ask each speaker in reverse order to respond to that from the audience. I would ask that people keep their questions and contributions brief and <coughs> As advertised, our speakers are changed slightly, I'm afraid. Rob Griffiths is the General Secretary of the Communist Party of Britain, is the author of a new pamphlet, The EU Brexit and Class Politics, and in 2016 he chaired the Lexit campaign. Lindsay German, on my left, is a socialist writer and campaigner. And on my right here is Eddie Dempsey, who is on the National Executive Committee of the RMT. Kelvin Hopkins, who is not with us as yet, and he is on his way as we speak because he had to be at the House of Commons for a vote at 7 pm tonight. He is a Labour MP for Luton North and a veteran campaigner for the EU, Britain to leave the EU. I now call upon Rob Griffiths to address the meeting. Uh, thank you, uh, Comrade Chair, um, comrades and friends. Uh, I'd just like to begin by supplementing a point that has already been made by Ruth. Of course, the Communist Party campaigned vigorously in the 1975 referendum against Britain continuing as a member of, the, uh, of what was then the European Community. Uh, but in fact, back in 1957, at the Communist Party's Congress that year, the party took a very clear position against the Treaty of Rome uh, and against the proposal uh, that Britain join this new European common market. In fact, the resolution actually said Britain's inclusion in the proposed European common market would strengthen further the position of West German capitalism and American imperialism at the expense of British trade. It is aimed to strengthen NATO and intensify the Cold War. And of course, in a series of pamphlets after that, for decades, the party uh, elaborated its analysis of the uh, European community or the European Union as it now is today, explaining that it is a big business project in the interests of monopoly capital against the interests of workers, not just in Britain, but workers in Europe and workers across the world. And that, uh, above all, it was an anti-socialist project designed by the main imperialist powers supported by the United States of America to try and block any advance uh, to socialism in any part of Europe. So we were very clear about the position we as a party took in the referendum last year, and we worked with our allies, allies in counterfire, in the SWP, in the Indian Workers' Association. We worked with the trade unions that opposed Britain's uh, continuing membership of the EU because, in our view, that class character of the EU has not changed at all since 1957. In fact, a whole series of treaties and policies and actions have only confirmed, I think, that analysis that we began all the way back then. And we had to take that position very clearly, even though there were many others on the left, including friends and comrades, with whom we've worked very closely on a whole range of issues, not least in the anti-war movement. There were a whole number of friends and comrades who didn't agree with us, either because they had delusions about the real character of the European Union and saw it as somehow an internationalist project. Well, it is. Of course, it's the internationalism of big business. It's the internationalism of the bosses. They mistook that uh, for being the internationalism of, of workers and peoples, which it most certainly, of course, is not. And we had to 
argue with the defeatists in the labor movement and on the left. And there were still plenty of those in the referendum campaign, uh, you may recall, who either thought that although they had misgivings about the European Union and thought it might be reformed even if they didn't, they didn't think we could win. They thought it was a, a shoe in for the Remain vote and so we were wasting our time campaigning against uh, EU membership and they said, even worse than that in their view, that our idea, our pipe dream, that we needed to be out of the EU so that a future left-led Labour government would be free to carry out progressive and left-wing policies, they thought that was a fantasy. There was no prospect of a left-led Labour government. It's uh, too easy these days to forget how widespread that view was on the left only a short while ago. But on both counts they said we were living in cloud cuckoo land. We wouldn't win the referendum and there was no immediate prospect of any kind of left-led Labour government. In fact, the opposite was going to happen. This is what many of our friends and allies were saying, that if Britain voted against the EU, it would be a field day for UKIP and the Tory right. They would sweep the board. We'd have a UKIP government, or at least a Tory government, dominated by its right wing, and Labour would be swept away. And of course, none of this, none of this has come about. Even the most right-wing elements in the Tory party leadership and in the cabinet, the, the anti-EU elements, are nowhere near a majority in this Tory cabinet. Almost all the major ministers in this cabinet, from the Prime Minister and the Chancellor and the Secretary of State for Defence, the Secretary of State for Health and so on downwards, all were in favour of Britain remaining in the EU. That's the reality. And that explains why after a brief period of disorientation in ruling class circles in Britain, they wanted to win that EU referendum. That was the position of the majority in the city. That was the position of the Bank of England, the CBI, the Institute of Directors, and all of their allies, not just in the European Union, but in the IMF, the OECD, NATO. They all chipped into that referendum campaign, if you remember, telling us what a disaster it would be from the day after we threw out EU membership in that referendum. So, of course, when they lost last, last, uh, 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 last year, when they lost, it disorientated them. It has disorientated them. It's taken them a while to assemble around a strategy that is now designed either to prevent Brexit from happening and find some way of reversing that referendum result, or failing that, to settle for what they like to call a soft Brexit. It's the Remainers who've invented that term, a soft Brexit, uh, which would be staying in the EU in everything but name. Staying aligned with the single market, aligned with EU rules, treaties and institutions. That's their fallback position. Uh, and of course that strategy also contains some other elements as well. It means win it needs to win public opinion, at least a sizable section to it, for whichever of those two options they can achieve. And an important part of that strategy has been to consolidate the pro-EU, pro-single market, anti-socialist actually, element, large element, in the Parliamentary Labour Party. That's been an important part of their strategy. Now, of course, we're always accused of conspiracy theories and so on, so I'm not going to deal in any, but when I talk about a ruling class strategy in Britain, that's not, um, that's not some invention of my imagination. I would refer, for example, to the EU Business Advisory Committee that Theresa May has set up about a year or so ago. Its last meeting was on October the 9th. Present, I don't know if there were any representatives of the CBI, the Institute of Directors, the British Chambers of Commerce, or the Federation of Small Businesses. They've attended most of the meetings, but the guest list that I've seen identifies some others who were present. Balfour Beatty. Some of you may have been blacklisted by them in the past. 
That's the, that's the company whose chief executive, Sir Martin Sorrell, took a pay cut last year from 70 million to 48 million. So, you know, we're all in it together. Balfour Beatty, the world's biggest advertising company, WPP. GlaxoSmithKline, their, their chief executive was present. Aston Martin, JCB, Vodafone, the champion tax dodgers. Whitbread, Nestle, Allied British Foods, they were all in the meeting, in 10 Downing Street. HSBC, Morgan Stanley, the Transnational Financial Corporation, American-based. Bridgewater, the world's largest hedge fund based in the United States. Their chief executive was at the meeting. Ernst & Young, one of the big four accountants. You, some of you may recall the role that they played in turning a blind eye to all the fraud and the corruption that led to the collapse of the bank of um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, sorry, not the bank, um, OneTel, Equitable Life, the Anglo-Irish Bank, Lehman Brothers, and so on. They were represented at 10 Downing Street. And then uh, uh, that's the same company, of course, that represents the tax dodging corporations, the Walt Disney, uh, Koch Industries, Skype. Um, and the extent of that corruption, by the way, was revealed when we had the so-called Luxembourg leaks, when all those papers were leaked about the giant corporate tax dodging fraud organized by Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the commission, when he was the prime minister of Luxembourg. So they're certainly all in it together. And the messages coming out of that business advisory council, effectively dictating the policy of the major majority in the Tory cabinet, have been, if you can't obstruct Brexit, then we must try and do everything possible to stay aligned with the single market, whether as part of the European Economic Area and EFTA, or, uh, uh, or by a new bilateral arrangement. That's what has to happen. And we need a transitional arrangement that will maintain the rules and submission to the institutions of the European Union and play for time. An extra two years inside the European Union single market and rules and institutions might give us enough time to reverse Brexit altogether. That's what they're saying to the Prime Minister. And that's the policy not only that she is carrying out, that's the policy, of course, that has been promoted. Uh, I, I, I can't wait for the Sunday papers uh, next weekend because that's when we find out what the latest Labour Party policy is. That's the position that he's been promoted. A long transitional agreement of up to four years, he says. A transitional agreement. Uh, staying in the single market uh, and all the rest of it. So this is the ruling class strategy and tragically it's reflected... <coughs> It's actually reflected in the, at the top of the Labour Party, very much, of course, against the instincts and the historical record of Jeremy Corbyn and, and to some extent, John MacDonald. Jeremy Corbyn has tried to fight back. He's pointed out how key Labour policies are incompatible with the single market rules and treaties of the European Union. That is the reality, and the Chair has spelt out some of the areas in which that's the case, and of course there are others. So, comrades and friends, I think we should be clear that the only kind of people's Brexit that is available is to get out of the EU without any submission to the single market rules and institutions. Also, without any enormous contribution by way of an extortionate EU divorce bill. We also need to disentangle ourselves from the EU common defence and foreign policy, which is explicitly aligned with NATO in the fun two fundamental treaties of the European Union. The campaign to win that argument, particularly in the Labour movement on the, on the left, has to continue. And that's why there will be discussions between the Communist Party and our allies in Lexit, in the trade union movement and so on, there will be discussions very soon on how we can ensure that the left-wing, working-class, anti-imperialist case against the European Union continues to be put 
and that we continue to fight for a, a, a real exit from the EU that's in the interests of workers and peoples, including across Europe and beyond Europe, a, 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 an EU exit in the interests of workers and peoples and not in the interests of big business. And I'll just finish on one point. I've spoken in France and Germany and Portugal since we've had the EU referendum result. There are many on the left in communist and workers' parties across the EU who have enormous sympathy with the position we're taking and in fact are pleased with the result of the referendum in the EU. Don't be fooled by all of the propaganda from the pro-EU camp and so on. There are many, many working class activists and trade unionists and socialists and communists who agree with the stance that we've taken in opposition to the EU. And they've said that the one thing that we showed to them in our referendum result was that it is possible, it is possible to leave the EU. It's been a little bit like, for them it's been a little bit like, uh, you remember the lyrics of Hotel California. You can check out when you like, but you can never leave. That's the message that they have had for decades. There is no alternative to the European Union. You can never leave. You can complain, you can criticize, you can try and reform, but you will never leave because there is nowhere else to go. And what they have said to me, Portuguese communists, German communists, French socialists, what they have said to me and other of our representatives is, you can show that there is an alternative to the European Union. There is another kind of society, there is another kind of Europe. So that's the struggle that we have to continue fighting, comrades, because we have to take Britain out of this big business, fortress Europe, imperialist, capitalist club. Thanks very much, and uh, and thanks for inviting me to uh, to speak here uh, tonight. I, I I want to follow on from Rob. I agree very much with uh, with the things that he said, but I think that one of the um, the things that we have to deal with as the left with this um, with the Brexit result, with the um, debates in Parliament, and of course all of the coverage in the media, all the mainstream politicians really want to talk as though this Brexit is divorced from everything else. It's not about workers' rights. It's not about what's going to happen to people. It's all about debates among mainstream politicians. And of course, a bit like when, you know, crops used to fail hundreds of years ago and they blamed it on witchcraft or they blamed it on... Um, you know, a god that was angry with people. Brexit has kind of taken that role, really, over the last year or so. Everything that's gone wrong with the British economy, and there was always quite a lot wrong with the British economy for anybody who wants a cursory study of it, is all down to Brexit. You know, the fact that there's low productivity, that's down to Brexit, although it's been going on long before the last year. Low wages, while well, they started, the decline in wages, as people know, started 10 years ago with the financial crash, not with Brexit. But again, uh, you're blamed for this. Everything is now blamed on, uh, on Brexit. And the fact that people don't want to work for below the minimum wage is regarded as a complete catastrophe rather than a point at which you should start to increase people's wages, which might be a logical way uh, to go. And I just thought I'd share with you, I don't know if you read The Guardian anymore, I find it hard, but I'm old enough to still like getting a print newspaper, I'm afraid. Um, and most of the alternatives are worse. Um, and it's got the headline today, and this is the headline of a national newspaper, Brexit is worst ever decision, says Bloomberg. Now, Mr. Bloomberg, if you didn't know, Michael Bloomberg, the billionaire media mogul, who's, his former wife was English, and so he's got a concern about this. Um, he says that Brexit is the single stupidest thing any country has ever done, apart from the election of Donald Trump as US president. Now, that is kind of pretty much the consensus. And 
there's a lot of really condescending, anti-working class attitudes towards the people who voted Brexit. They're all stupid. They're all um, incapable of coming to their own ideas. They're all people who are influenced by the sun. Now, I'm not saying that there weren't people who, cut, who fit this description who voted leave. There may have been some of them who voted remain as well. But the truth of the matter is, I think the decision that people made was a decision, actually, which people took very, very seriously. And I think it was a reflection of a number of things. And again, we can argue about what exactly, you know, what the different ratio of things was. But it seems to me that a lot of it was a sense of kicking back at the kind of people who run our society, the employers, the politicians, the media, all of those people, it's very much put in those kind of terms. So I think it's important that we do understand that first of all. And I also think it's, it's very important, as Robert said, this is a question which now goes absolutely to the heart of British politics. You know, I think the biggest threat from Jer for Jeremy Corbyn because since the election, of course, even the most Neanderthal Blairite has realised that he can win an election, and that's kind of, you know, kept all their manoeuvring behind doors. I don't think we should think for a minute it's not going on, it, but it's behind doors. But when you look at what they're, really, the, what they're trying to do is they're trying to use the whole argument over the EU, I think, to weaken the left in the Labour Party, to weaken Jeremy Corbyn. This is done through this all-party committee, which is run by um, Chuka Ramuna, who's one of the most unpleasant Blairites, and um, Anna Soubry, who's supposed to be a left-wing conservative. I don't quite know what that is in terms of... But she's meant to be sort of more humane than, than some of the others. I suppose that's not too difficult when you look at, uh, when you look at some of them. What are they really talking about? And I think that, uh, that Rob is absolutely... That what they would like, ideally, is this goes on long enough so that everybody gets tired, people start changing their minds, people just think, oh my God, we can't face any more of these long and turgid debates over Brexit, and nothing happens. I mean, Vince Cable has said this quite openly, I don't actually think Brexit is going to happen. And what he means is he will do everything that he can to make sure that we don't leave the European Union because they regard this as a complete uh, disaster. So I think this is a big fault line in Labour and I think it's something that the Labour left really need to wake up to because it is a question that the more this is put, you know, the more people go on demonstrations waving EU flags and thinking they're doing this for good liberal reasons, actually the more this will, will weaken the people who really want to change British society and who want to change society uh, abroad as well. So I think that is a very important question uh, for us. I also think we have to stress the EU record. I mean, for those of us, and uh, many people I know in the room were people who campaigned to leave um, for a left leave of the, um, of the European Union. And we said at the time, the European Union is not a nice institution. Look what it did to Greece. Look at what it has tried to do to Portugal. Look at all these uh, different kind of places. And lots of people on the left said, well, look, I agree with you about your characterization of the EU, but I'm still going to vote Remain because... Lots of people said because of racism, which is a serious argument, and I think it's an argument that we have to take very seriously. I mean, there is uh, a, a nasty trend of racism, not, actually less so in this country than a number of other countries, but is a serious problem for us as a whole um, across Europe. But they said, well, I agree with you, but I'm going to vote Remain. OK. What happens now, what, 15 months later, is these same people, you rarely hear any criticism of them at all over the EU. I'll just point to three things. First is the question of Catalonia. Now, people here will probably have all sorts of different views as to whether Catalonia should be independent and so on. But if you look at what the EU is doing, and very, very clearly doing, it's backing a right-wing government in Madrid, um, descendant, quite literally, of the Franco people, anointed by the Franco people, as was the, um, the monarchy um, after Franco died in the 1970s. Um, seeing the Guardia Civil going in and beating up people who are trying to vote, it seems to me that this goes against the... EU notion of self-determination, which is all very well until they want 
to keep things together. And remember, people who remember the breakup of Yugoslavia will remember it was a very, very different picture then that uh, Helmut Kohl and various other people encouraged the independence of Croatia and, and of course, Kosovo. And, uh, uh, you know, this is a big question. The question of Malta, the journalist who was blown up the other week, expose the fact that this is an EU country which is there for, as is Cyprus, there for money laundering, uh, huge levels of gangsterism, all this other kind of thing. And then thirdly, of course, people will know the terrible election results in Austria a couple of weeks ago where the FPO, the far-right party, is going to form government with the, um, the other right-wing uh, right party. When this happened before, the EU put sanctions on Austria for having far-right people in their government. Does anybody seriously think this is going to happen now? And it really can't happen now from their point of view because you have Hungary, you have the Czech Republic, which has just elected a, another billionaire right-wing Trump-type figure to be, their, uh, to be their leader, and you've got um, the situation in Poland, all of which now have extremely right-wing governments. So this is a trend, and the people who say voting against the EU creates racism, I would argue the EU itself is one of the, and the, the way in which the EU has destroyed so many industries and destroyed so many lives and so on, is one of the reasons that people look to these racist parties and look to... Um, Look to, uh, look to the right. And it's something that's a big challenge for us on the left that we've got to try and deal with. Uh, Rob mentioned the question of militarism and defence. I mean, again, if I hear anybody else say to me, um, the EU has stopped war in Europe for 70 years, I mean, hasn't anybody noticed? Well, uh, I mean, let's leave aside the wars that France and Britain and Italy get involved in outside of Europe, you know, pretend they don't happen, Algeria and, uh, you know, all the other things that have happened. But, you know, the whole of Yugoslavia, there was a war for a decade, there's been wars on the edge of Europe in Ukraine, all right, it's not in the EU, but the EU has been very, very much involved in, uh, in all of those things, the enlargement of NATO, all of those things, and the, uh, people may not know this, but although we have austerity across Europe, which is attacking our schools and hospitals, the European Commission has decided that this shouldn't apply to military spending. That's got to be given free reign because they've got to catch up with, there's only four countries in Europe that are in NATO that are, um, that are paying the 2%, and they want to um, catch up. Now, this, I think, of the situation when we, when we look at it, the EU has not changed its spots. If anything, with the kind of crisis that we've got now, we will see more of the kind of polarisation and division. And, you know, they all hoped that the Dutch election, it looked like there was a centre party victorious. Macron in France, they thought this is great centre party. They don't notice that the centre parties, of course, are attacking workers' rights and attacking trade unions. I mean, massive attack in France, as I'm sure people here are aware. So you've got this polarisation to left and right, and it seems the challenge for the left in this country, I think we're very fortunate in this country that we do have Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party. I think that kind of has transformed the situation here. And actually, the far right here are weaker than they have been for a long time, and they are weaker than they are in most of the other parts of Europe. But I don't think we can be complacent about this. This is something, there is a race going on, and either working people take control of their lives, working people take control of the kind of society that we want to have, working people ensure that there is equality and justice and that everybody uh, receives uh, the right kind of house and, and jobs and all these kind of things, or we will see the growth of the far right even worse than we've seen now. So I think this is a very, very important question. Um, I'm very glad to be here to contribute to it tonight. And I think one of the things that Jeremy Corbyn didn't do too badly in the election was he did try to get a kind of people's Brexit approach. Keir Starmer is definitely trying to abandon anything like that. I think one of the things is we need to spell out concretely what we want, what we think a society outside of the EU, which benefits working people should look like, public services, investment in jobs, an emergency housing programme, all these sorts of questions. That's the kind of thing we need to be talking about. Thanks.
very much, Lindsay. I'm now going to call upon Eddie Dempsey from the RMT Executive to address the meeting. Eddie. Hello, can you hear me all? Yep. Yeah, so in the uh, finest traditions of the Labour and workers movement in this country, I'm going to start by going backwards rather than forwards. And I was having a look the other day at a resolution from our Glasgow Number no. 5 branch, which was submitted to our executive back in the 70s during the time of the first European referendum. And it noted um, a rule in our rule book. A lot of our activists in our union will famously quote you if you give them half a chance on any picket line on March they're on which is Rule 1, Clause 4b, to work for the supersession of the capitalist system by a socialistic order of society. So the resolution noted that rule in our rule book and went on to say that they believed entry into the European Union or, or, or the European Community, whatever it was called back then, represented an uh, attack on the sovereign national democracy, democracy of this country, which was what would be needed in order to implement that rule and to make socialist changes in this country. I'm paraphrasing obviously, but that was the general gist of what the resolution said. And it made me think that's more or less the same argument we're having now. Uh, and that if we, if we want to make socialist changes in this country, and if Jeremy Corbyn wants to implement the, uh, the policies he has within his manifesto, then you're going to need uh, a democratic process with the ability to make those changes. And all of that is absent within the European Union. And Going back again, you know, this is a position that was traditionally held by the entire labour movement, uh, by most of the trade unions in this country, and that only changed in 1988 when Jacques Delors came over to TUC in Bournemouth, who uh, came over and sold the idea of a social Europe to a trade union movement which was in a period of defeatism under Thatcher, uh, which had a real kick in by the Tories, uh, promised them that social Europe was going to deliver workers' rights and high wages and everything else and that the class struggle was, was more or less over, that they were going to do the job for us. And you fast forward to the debate that's happened over the European Union uh, most recently, and it's the same sort of arguments. People telling us that the European Union is what gives us workers' rights. They would say to me things like, we've got the working time directive, which every low-paid worker in this country, when they sign their contract of employment, also signs an opt-out of, otherwise they don't have the job. Uh, and then I look at the workers where, where I am. We're on a 35-hour week, uh, and that wasn't given to us by any uh, group of people in suits far away. That was delivered to us by ourselves, struggling and organising together uh, and making those demands of the employers. Uh, you had all sorts of other things said about workers' rights. The Agency Workers Directive, we were told, protected people in the most precarious employment situations, when in reality what that piece of legislation was for was to make outsourcing an acceptable route of employment. You saw outfits like G4S and Mighty, their profits skyrocketed by about 200% over that period. Uh, and it came with a nice little clause, clause in it for the bosses, which meant any agency worker in this country hasn't had any benefit of it. I'm sure that the numbers are minuscule because it's got a clause in there which allows employers to by bypass that piece of legislation which forces them to give workers their rights. And so, I don't want to go too far over all the old debates that we've had, but it seems a really strange thing to me, people who are on the left of politics, when you say to them that the treaties, that the institutions of the EU prevent uh, a labour movement in this country taking national democratic ownership of our industries, they, when you show them the actual texts of these, of these uh, treaties and, uh, and, pieces, and pieces of legislation, they say to you, ah, but it doesn't say the word privatisation. And you think, you know, anyone who's ever been in a trade union or ever had any connection with a labour movement knows. What they do is they come and say, ah, modernisation. That's the sort of language they use. You're never going to get a boss who's going to say to you, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to sack half the workforce. We're going to tear up your terms and conditions so we can have more profits. They never say that. They say, we're here to modernise. Just like in the EU treaties and pieces of legislation, they, make similar sort, they use similar sort of language. And, and we should know better and we should look beyond that, uh, people on the left, and recognise that. So, without going over too much of the stuff that's gone on before, it seems to me the question about what sort of Brexit do we want now um, is pretty simple. It's Brexit. Because the debate that's going on, is it a soft Brexit? Is it a red, white and blue Brexit? is it this, that, any other thing, Brexit, is all sort of smoke and mirrors. 
uh, masking the central point is that people in this country vote for Brexit and that means leaving the European Union, its institutions and its treaties. The lot of it. Uh, and it seems to me that if we're going to make any progress at all, that's the position we've got to have. And people have spoken earlier uh, about some of the stuff that's been going on in the Labour movement, particularly around Keir Starmer um, and, his, and his moves towards sort of undermining Brexit as a route to attacking Corbyn. It's all completely true. I was at TUC recently and the TUC put together a motion trying to put together all the views of the different trade unions like mine, which has a very strong anti-EU uh, position and others which have a pro-EU position. And they came up with these four tests. The TUC came up with four tests that would mean a Brexit would be compatible with the demands of the working class in this country, the organised workers. And very subtly they included in that a statement that said membership of the single market would meet those four tests. Now, that's pretty astounding when you think the single market, Thatcher's single market, the free market and all the competition rules and everything that goes along with it, that that meets the test to uh, make sure that we've got a workers' Brexit. It seems to me that is one of the central parts of the European Union that working class people need to get out of, um, never mind meeting any tests. And so the trade unions at TUC, um, despite the RMT voting against it, as we would normally do, voted for that and you could see it happening, you know, the your arms hadn't even fallen uh, and the headlines were already out there that the TUC and the Labour movement is putting pressure on Jeremy Corbyn to abandon a hard Brexit, you know, and so this is, this is quite insidious and this is the way it's working and then you saw following the TUC the Labour Party conference and it was a similar sort of thing. There was all this outcry in the papers about how undemocratic the Labour Party conference was for not debating this wild Brexit motion that was put up. Um, really as a front to undermine Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, and he was similarly attacked when he went on the Andrew Neil programme and said something that I've been waiting my whole life to hear a Labour leader say. He was talking about the free movement of Labour being used by corporations to undermine workers' terms and conditions here. He was speaking specifically about um, big employers bringing in workers into some of the distribution warehouses we've got here on a seasonal basis, on minimum terms and conditions, on absolutely horrendous uh, terms of employment and undermining any attempt to have trade union organisation in a place like that. He wasn't talking about the man or woman coming here from another country seeking to better themselves and have a better life. He was talking about a specific uh, type of, um, a, 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 specific, a specific method of employers using uh, workers from one place to undermine the terms and conditions of workers in another place and exploit both. Uh, and that was really refreshing to hear that, but immediately following that you had people from the left shamelessly coming out and saying, well, Jeremy Corbyn, he's abandoned migrants, this is potentially racist, this is all a disgrace what he said, um, and really condemning him for it. But when you examine those sort of arguments in a bit more detail, you'll see, even from the Blairites, when they talk about free movement of labour being this big principled and important thing they must have, uh, and being a central part of workers' rights, you, you have another look and you see they're quite happy to bin it if they can stay in the single market. So what they're in fact doing is using the plight of migrant workers as a political weapon uh, against their opponents, uh, which, is, which is quite shameless. Uh, and it's similar from other people, even further, from the other side of the left, who will say that any kind of immigration controls or any kind of opposition to complete free movement from everywhere is inherently racist. But at the same time, these people only make a demand on the Labour Party uh, in the main, not everyone, only make a demand on the Labour Party to uh, keep EU free movement of Labour. Um, if your position is that you should have complete free movement from everywhere, but you're only prepared to make a political demand for free movement within the European Union, either you're suffering from political cowardice, or that's not a generally held, generally held uh, position in the first place. And just like the Blairites, you're using it as a political weapon against those you oppose. So we've got to be careful when we hear people talking about these things. Um, and the other thing they do is they, they, they try to abstract those who want to overturn Brexit, free movement of labour from the single market, as if it's something separate from it. And they try to muddy the waters by talking about EU free movement of labour in terms of immigration. The EU free movement of labour is not immigration. Immigration is where someone moves to another country, you stay there, you become a citizen of that country and participate in all the rest of it. The EU free movement of labour is about using people specifically as labour having a bigger surplus, surplus supply of labour and uh, using those people to work temporarily in one place, 
not with full citizen rights, without the right to vote in the same way as other workers do uh, and other rights, in order to provide cheap wages in places where um, the uh, private owners of the economy can't move production abroad. And, you know, that's, they're, quite, they're, they're very clear about this sort of thing. So even Andy Burnham said, you've got the right to move, not the right to claim. So, you know, we're told people should have the right to live anywhere. I'm still waiting for Islington Council to transfer me out of a one-bedroom uh, flat that I've got with my son over there to a nice gaff in on Thames because I've got a right to live wherever I want. <laughs> but I don't think that I'll be getting that any time soon. What, in reality, it's Norman, Norman Tebbit's right to get on your bike is, is essentially what it's all about. And if, if the European Union and its institutions have destroyed the economy in your country, well, then you can get on your bike and you can come over here or to another country where they can't pick the railways up and move them abroad or they can't pick up the construction industry here and move them abroad and it's supply of cheap labour can come to the source. That's, that's the whole point of it. Um, but yeah, essentially what they're trying to do is sort of extract, abstract a little bit from that. So you've got this... Behind, in front of Keir Starmer, shall we say, you've got Chaka Ramuna with his campaign for uh, uh, membership of the single market. And then you've got this campaign for free movement of labour. And then you've got Keir Starmer there as well. So we're all making sort of gradual changes and reinforcing each other. Uh, and that's what it's about. It's about trying to pretend that the EU free movement of labour is not part of the single market, um, which is being used as a sort of a, a batter, battering ram to force us into supporting. And then people tell you single market is not actually part of... Uh, Brexit. People didn't vote to leave the single market. Uh, there's loads of people out there apparently who just want to be in the single market. And then the other thing they do is they say this is all about trade, as if the single market was only about trade. Uh, it's very rare you see any kind of treaty or deal uh, that has got anything that, that is anywhere near simply about trade. I mean, if it was a pure trade deal we'd have, there'd be no one opposed to it. No one's opposed to trading. Uh, but, uh, but the simple truth is that's not what it's about. It's about taking... And it's about taking democracy out of decision making around economics. It's about removing the ability of workers in this country through the democratic processes of having a say in how the economy is run and who owns it and in whose interests it should be run. And if you think about the history of our movement, you go right back from the Chartists to the suffragettes up to the modern day. Our entire history has been about taking democratic ownership of the industries that we work in and also taking democratic control of the government of our country in, in its entirety. And so you cannot do that within the European Union. You know, for all his faults, at least in this country, you can, we can elect people like Kelvin to Parliament um, who can represent us there and who can put policies forward on our behalf. You can't do that in the European Union. You can't vote for anyone who can propose any legislation at all. Um, and so that's the long and short of it. That's where we are. I don't, I don't really have anything else to say beyond that. But just we should, be, we should be very careful with people when they're using moralistic language about the plight of migrant workers as a weapon in reality, to confuse people uh, and to appeal to people's, you know, decent instincts and morals to support each other, as really as a cover for, for promoting Thatcherism, because that's what it is. The single market is Thatcherism, and we need to get out of it, and all of the other institutions as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eddie. Um, I'd like now to call upon. Kelvin Hopkins, the Luton MP, Labour MP, to address the meeting. Thank you. Well, uh, I've, got to, I've got to use this apparently. Is that right? It is, it is. Well, good evening, comrades. It's uh, nice to be here and to talk about uh, leaving the European Union. I'm uh, Kelvin Hopkins, Member of Parliament for Luton North, a lifelong opponent of the common market and later the European Union, and I'm co-chair of Labour Leave. What is astonishing is how, um, you know, I'm in a small minority within the Parliamentary Labour Party when 40 years ago we had a massive majority for leaving the common market, which was far less pernicious than the European Union. Um, if we go back in time, uh, we had not just Tony Benn and more recently Bob Crow, we had Barbara Castle, Peter Shaw, Brian Gould, Jack Jones, many others, leaders in the Labour movement who were all opposed to the common market, all wanted to leave on democratic and socialist grounds. And indeed, it's actually Hugh Gateskill who opposed joining the common market in the first place. Um, and of course, if you go back even further, recently I was told that Clem Attlee actually opposed joining the common market. So, you know, there's a, a, a 
track record, and I agree with all of those people, haven't changed my views, but round about me, everybody else seems to have changed somewhat. Um, but nevertheless, I still think the case against the common market and for democracy um, and restoring democracy is, is, is a very strong case, and I continue to make that case. Indeed, some three years ago, I wrote a pamphlet, this is called European Union, A View from the Left, um, and uh, that was intended, I wrote about sort of, I printed about 30 copies, photocopy, just to hand out to other MPs. A friend of mine said oh, it should be produced, but uh, pub published, and so it was published by Labour Euro Safeguards campaign. Um, and uh, during the referendum campaign, apparently 141,000 copies of that went out to Labour movement, Labour Party, and trade unions across the country. Might have had a bit of influence, who knows? Um, I hope it did, but I, I stand by what I wrote in that. And if you look at the beginning, the first few words I said, three years ago when I drafted it, I said the European Union is anti-democratic, anti-socialist and in the process of economic decline. I think that's still true today and I think we've got to change it from the inside by moving, by, by countries becoming independent democratic countries again. If we go back to the 1983 general election, which I fought for Labour, at that time we had a wonderful manifesto calling for coming out of the European Union, or common market as it was then, and actually having what they called coordinated reflation. Every country managing their own economy so we could grow together. We weren't frightened of of, of, uh, of, of, um, being, um, of being undermined by other countries because each country could manage its own economy. So anti-democratic, well, of course, what is about the EU, let's not kid ourselves, it's about diminishing the role of state, elected state governments and, and handing power first to the European Commission, which is carefully designed to make sure power resides in the Commission and not elsewhere, and then over time to shift that power, that economic power, to the, to the markets and to the corporate world. It's a component of globalisation, a component of neoliberalism, but it's, it's the re European regional group of that, but it's actually about handing power to the corporates. And if you want any evidence of that, look at, look at TTIP. They were gung-ho over TTIP. Eventually, it, they couldn't get it through and it collapsed, but nevertheless, that's what they wanted. Giving total power to co the corporate world to actually prosecute governments if they had the tem temerity to take something back into public ownership. And it wasn't just losing this year's profits, but all future profits they could be prosecuted for, making public ownership impossible. Um, thank goodness that, is, that has gone. But we still have a situation where the European Union wants to, to, to drive things into the market. They want to, first of all, liberalise and marketise, and then eventually um, privatise as well. We only have to look what's happening in the railways. It's the fourth railway package, which I'm sure RMT have talked about a lot. Um, they want to inflict um, privatisation on, on the British st style uh, across uh, the, the state railways in Europe. Those countries have resisted that m movement so far, but that's the direction they want to move, to liberalise, marketise, privatise, and, um, and, and get the railways into the, into the mess we've been in since privatisation in Britain. Um, and uh, they're, re they're resisting that. It's very interesting that a report came out some seven years ago showing that the state railways in the continent of Europe uh, are not just cheaper to, to, to those who use them, um, with strong trade union control as well, with for all the working, all the members who work for them, but they were also f up to 40% cheaper to run. Ours have got massive subsidies, and those subsidies go straight into the pockets of the private companies. And if you want any evidence of that, look what happened at the uh, to the East East Coast Main Line. And for five years, it was in it was forced back into public ownership because the privateers walked away; they couldn't make enough profit. But that meant a billion pounds in, in surplus went into the Treasury instead of into the private pockets, just one railway line. Imagine if it was all back in public ownership and would all run as an co integrated, coordinated whole with low affairs, well-paid staff and producing surpluses, or not surpluses, reducing the level of subsidy because the surpluses come from the train operators, not from the, not from the, the infrastructure. But we would save billions of pounds every year which could be used for well, investing in the railways for a start, but also for other things like the health service, education, and other public services. So, um, rail privatisation has been a, a, a terrible mistake, but it was a, a if you like, a, um, 
a laboratory experiment to see how privatisation worked um, to, to get um, get things into the into the private sector um, as a model for what they wanted elsewhere. But democracy is is a is a much misused word. Democracy is not very meaningful if you don't have any power through it. If if governments are elected um, but don't have actually any control over the economy, then it's just decoration. It's not real democracy. Real democracy means governments who have actual power, uh, and we've seen the power of governments diminished over time, um, partly by the EU but also by privatisation. Um, when if we go back 40 years uh, and certainly 50 years. We had a high proportion of our economy in public ownership. The government could use that to ma help manage the economy. We had full employment. We had uh, working class living standards rising at a rate unprecedented in history. We saw millions of council houses good quality council houses built, housing people in a standard they'd never seen before. Um, we saw the welfare state, and particularly the National Health Service, created. Um, we saw redistributive taxation. We saw wages uh, as a relatively higher proportion of the economy, which have declined dramatically ever since. That world worked. Now, we're not talking about socialism, really. It's post-war Keynesian management of the economies, which I have supported. I call myself a, a, a left Keynesian, in, if, if you want to describe what I am in, in economic and political terms. But we had a world that actually worked. But it, was, it really angered the capitalist class because they, want, they could see that they could make profit. Um, and this was um, actually seeing what would be their profit going into, into wealth in the welfare state, into rising living standards for working people, and so on. So, but the EU is all part of that system. They can't work too quickly because if they do, they will be found out and they will be um, they, they will be resisted very strongly. In fact, there is a lot of resistance on the continent of Europe already, and indeed I have spoken uh, on the continent of Europe to left-wing Eurosceptic groups. But here's a quote from Jean Monnet, founding father of the European Union. He was actually what they call a socialist, but not my kind of socialist. Um, he said, Europe's nations should be guided towards the superstate without their people understanding what is happening. That's what he said, um, and I use that quote quite a lot because I think it just illustrates what the EU is really like, what it's about. Um, and of course, democracy can be designed in particular ways. You can have first past the post, which I tend to favour. Many comrades in the room may have different view. But I think first past the post gives a choice of government. Um, if you have one member seats um, and you tend to have larger parties, you can actually present an alternative view. And next time round, we're going to have a definite alternative. We're going to have a right-wing Tory uh, party against a democratic socialist party led by Jeremy. Um, something I think is a massive change. I can hardly believe what's happened in the last two or three years. Uh, when a, a small number of us used to uh, you know, keep, the, keep the socialist flag flying on the back benches um, when the, when the, the, the Blair um, regime was, was in control. The, the fact that we've now got Jeremy as our leader doing a superb job and we're moving towards the situation where we're going to have a Labour government led by a democratic socialist who's going to restore some what's me watch we lost, I think that is remarkable. But of course we won't be able to do all the things we want to do inside the European Union because the rules will prevent it. So we have to get out just to, do, to, to implement our agenda. Um, if we look at what's happened on the continent of Europe as well, um, I said in economic decline. Well, some countries do relatively well inside the EU, one in particular, Germany. But if you look at Southern Europe, what's happened there is absolutely vicious. And it's, it, it, it's definitely anti-democratic, definitely anti-socialist, and failing economically. Greece, we've seen living standards cut by 25%. We've seen up to 60% of young people unemployed, 25% unemployed overall. Um, we saw a situation where in return for bailouts, the European Union, the bankers, insisted that they abandon collective bargaining. And then as another um, condition for bailout, they were forced into fire sales of public assets. So, you know, selling off um, all their nationalised sector, um, public, uh, public works and so on, all sold to pri the private sector as a condition of, of a bailout. I mean, they, when, it, when it comes to the crunch, the EU is very, very right-wing and very pro-global pro, pro, um, capitalism, and certainly not on the side of, of working people. Um, we've seen over the last 30 or 40 years, as neoliberalism has taken a grip of our economies, we've seen the proportion of our economy going to wages has been savagely cut. 
And it's not surprising that we have uh, um, poverty in many cases uh, and a wide, a much wider dispersion of income with it, within Britain and across the world too, because we've seen a move towards marketization, privatization, liberalization, and the re reduction of the government role, a state role in, in the economy. I make no bones about it. I want to see the state role restored. I want to see public ownership of the utilities. Um, it's part of our manifesto now. I want to see um, higher taxes on the rich and redistribution of income. I want to see a wealth tax. Um, I want to see all sorts of things which used to be standard, a standard view inside the Labour Party. And we're gradually getting back there now. But all of that would benefit working class people immensely. I don't think working young working people can really believe how good it was in relative terms for their previous generation. I was part of that generation when you could walk from factory to factory and get a job. Um, when trade unions, there were 12 million trade unionists when I worked at the TUC, there are now 6 million trade unionists, where the big companies, the private companies are all gone, where we're looking to see uh, poverty in old age because pensions uh, have, have been cut, um, you know, occupational pensions have, have effectively disappeared. There's uh, so many things we have to do, but we had a world that worked. It was, might have been called social democracy, I think that's a word I tend not to use, I prefer democratic socialism. But that world, we had a world that worked, designed at Bretton Woods effectively in 1944, and carried on until they reinvented 19th century laissez-faire capitalism, which we now call neoliberalism. I think we've got to resist neoliberalism, reverse neoliberalism, restore democratic socialism, and restore a world where working people have power and decent lives again. Thank you. To say something else, I want I, there's another meeting next door um, put on by the Evening Standard, and I want to go in there as well. That's the, the George Osborne uh, position, which I want to go and test myself. Um, if I can get in and ask a few questions, I should do that. But if you don't mind, I would I'd like to go there. Oh, well, I would like Kelvin if you could wait a little while because yes. there's likely to be questions and some contributions, so I'd like some responses from. Okay. Colleagues, we're now at that point where I'd ask people to indicate they want to come and debate or make contributions. Comrade at the back, followed by the gentleman at the front, followed by the gentleman at the back over there, right at the very back. And then I'll come back again. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll assume that I'm Comrade at the back. You are. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, just a, a quick question. I'm glad that Colin is still here for this one because I like his thoughts on it, really, which is I mean, uh, thank you very much to the panel. Uh, I, won't, I don't want to make an extended contribution. I want to make one little point and then a question to the panel. And one little point, I suppose, that I want to make is, is that, um, you know, what's really interesting about, about this period is that uh, we're kind of having the ideological debate on, in the Labour movement and the Labour, around the Labour Party and the organisations of the left that we should have been having during the referendum. And we're flushing out some of those arguments around the nature of the single market in a way uh, that we should have. And, and I think we're winning those arguments where we get to make them because the arguments on the side, you know, the arguments that are made about the nature of the single market are so poor. You know, this, the level of understanding is so poor. If I see one more reference to the, the constitutional neutrality of the, uh, of the European Union on the issue of public ownership, uh, in com completely missing the point about how, uh, how liberalisation is working. Uh, then I'll go nuts. But anyway, uh, so we're winning those arguments, but we uh, when we get to make them. But my worry is, and I'll, you know, the panel's view on this, I welcome, is that we haven't got the organisational strength.